All right, guys, let's do our water review. This should feel very familiar from your general biology class with perhaps a couple of new wrinkles, but we're going to just dive right in. First, here's a preview. Uh, you learned already about polarity, uh, the polarity of the water molecule. So we're going to do a quick review of that. And then the rest of these properties are all um, subsequent to that polarity. They're all caused by the polarity of the water molecule. So we have cohesion, adhesion, capillary action, which is really just kind of a combo of those two. Um, water's role in temperature control in um, uh, ecosystems and within uh, biological organisms. It's density, um, which is different than uh, between solid and liquid. It's a, little, it's a little different mix than most substances and its role as a solvent. So quick, quick review. You just went over this when we did our chemistry um, review. Remember, water is a polar molecule. That means that part of the molecule, the oxygen atom, has a higher electronegativity and therefore is pulling harder on those electrons than the hydrogens that are participating in that covalent bond. So the water ends up with a slight negative charge and the hydrogen atoms end up with a slight positive charge. This causes all sorts of cool things, including starting with cohesion. Cohesion is just water's attraction to itself. So here you can see some water molecules are interacting within um, the xylem, the water tubes of a leaf. You can see they are attracted to one another. That is part of the story of how the water can travel upwards through those tubes into the leaf where it needs to go. So this is um, water's attraction to itself. It's also responsible, by the way, for surface tension. You see surface tension when you are able to um, carefully pile a lot of water molecules together to form a little dome on a cup. Sometimes when we do the little penny thing, uh, penny activity that we do with water, you can see the little, like you can make a little rounded cap. That's surface tension or water basically holding on to one another, forming almost like a skin. It's not a skin, but that, that's kind of the idea. Yep. Cohesion. Next up is adhesion or water's attraction to other molecules. So water, of course, being polar, having that positive and negative portion to it is going to be attracted to other charged things. So really anything that has a charge. And this is due to the polarity of the water, the positive and negative charge on the molecule. This is the other piece of the story of how water molecules are able to travel against gravity within um, within plants. So here you can see you can see the water molecules are attracted to the walls of those tubes. They are, they're attracted to each other through cohesion, but they're also attracted to the walls of the tube through adhesion. We're going to take a little closer look here of those things working together. So the full story includes both water's cohesion or attraction to itself. So you can see kind of in the middle, you see water molecules represented by uh, dots are attracted to each other. And then on the sides there, you can see the water molecules are attracted to the sides of the tube, the xylem. And because of that, they're able to kind of snake upwards and move against gravity. Um, so the water can get to where the plant needs it to go. That process together is called capillary action. So capillary action is kind of just cohesion and adhesion together in a specific application, but we usually list it separately. And this little graphic is just kind of showing you all of it together. So this is where um, the water molecules are attracted to the sides of the tube and able to climb up cohesion playing a role in the middle. All right, next up is something that may be a little less familiar to you, and this is water's role in temperature control. Because water is so attracted to itself, these molecules are attracted to each other with like within a body of water, it has a high what we call specific heat. So specific heat is the amount of heat energy that you need to put into one gram of a substance to raise that gram one degree Celsius. 
All you really need to know about this is that it takes a lot of heat energy to raise the temperature of a body of water. It can absorb a ton of heat energy before its temperature actually goes up. Why? It's because of those hydrogen bonds. Remember, temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy or movement energy of those molecules. And when they are attracted to one another, they're kind of holding each other kind of close together and in place. And they're not able to move as quickly as easily, right? So you can put a lot of heat energy. And because those water molecules are basically kind of stuck together in a certain way, um, they're not able to move around really fast. And therefore, their temperature, the temperature of that water together is going to stay lower. So this is just saying what I just said. So you have to put a lot of water or a lot of heat energy into that water to get those molecules to actually move faster and increase the temperature of the water. So why do we care about that? Well, it has some important implications for um, biological organisms separately, but also ecosystems because it can moderate um, air temperature. So looking at this graphic here, you can see an example of something that you actually already know, which is coastal ecosystems or areas will have more temperate um, weather. The temperature stays close to the same, um, you know, in different times of day and in, and in um, the winter versus the summer as compared to a more inland place. And the reason for that is because the water has this moderating effect. The water can absorb a bunch of that heat energy, um, not change its own temperature very much, but taking that heat away from the land. So it's, it's not going to heat up the area nearby um, as much. This property also stabilizes ocean temperature. Like I said, it can absorb a ton of heat energy, but water, the temperature of the water itself is not going to uh, change that much. So if you are an organism that's living in that marine environment, that's great for you because you're not going to have to um, adapt to, you know, those greatly changing temperatures. And also, like I mentioned, that can, can play a role in single organisms' ability to re resist changes in their own inter internal temperature. This is a variation on the same theme. So evaporative cooling is the cooling that happens when water evaporates from a surface, like when you sweat, when the water uh, molecules are evaporating from your skin, that's and it cools down, that's called evaporative cooling. And that is happening because, again, water can absorb a bunch of heat energy um, before it will turn into a gas. So in the process of water evaporating or going from a liquid, say on your skin, to a gas in the air, it's going to absorb a lot of heat and it can take a lot of heat from your body. That's why sweating can cool us because as uh, the water evaporates, it's taking a lot of that heat with it. And like I said, this is just the exact same concept as specific heat, just kind of like a different application and different phase change. But remember, just notice as we go through, all of this comes back to water's polarity. If you have a strong understanding of what polarity is and what it does to water molecules in a group, you can, you can kind of figure some of these out, even if you haven't fully remembered every detail here. And then here are just some examples. I already mentioned sweating. This can moderate Earth's climate as water evaporates from surfaces on the Earth. Um, stabilizing the temperature in lakes and ponds as water evaporates from the surface of those bodies of water. Um, sweating, we talked about, as the water is evaporating from our skin, it's taking a bunch of heat to do that. And it happens on leaves. So water that's, you know, like dew on the leaves, as that dew will evaporate into the air, it's going to have a cooling and moderating effect on the leaf itself. All right, this one you're familiar with already because you have had glass of, a glass of ice water before, I'm sure. And that is that frozen uh, water, solid water, will float on liquid water, which is not the usual way. Typically, um, a solid will sink in its associated liquid. But in this case, because uh, of water's polarity and its attraction to itself, when it's able to move around in a liquid, it will, those molecules will nestle close together, allowing the positively charged hydrogens to, you know, get in close with a negatively charged oxygen. 
as those molecules slow down enough to start forming a solid, they will actually get frozen in this lattice structure that you can see next to the ice. Um, because those hydrogen bonds are fixed, and they're going to be basically stuck kind of far apart from each other. And that makes that substance less dense and allows it to float, which is kind of like, you know, cool and interesting, but it's actually really important um, for, you know, it does lots of things. But one of the most important applications of this is that it will allow marine life to survive under floating ice um, during the winter or in, in, um, really cold places, even if they're really cold all the time, it's allowing the warmer water to be underneath, um, that frozen ice. That's really important. And then finally, we're going to talk about water's role as a solvent. You've may have heard that water is the universal solvent. It can't actually dissolve everything, um, but it can solve, it can dissolve a lot of things that are, um, charged or polar in some way very versatile. And I want to actually skip down and first um, do a quick review of the parts of a solution. Remember that a solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. In the case of this graphic, you can see it's a salt water solution. And there are two parts of a solution. There's the solute, which is the substance that's being dissolved. In this case, it's salt. And the solvent, which is the, sol the, the substance that's doing the dissolving. So water is really good at being the uh, doing the dissolving for lots of different substances. And how this happens is that the um, positively and negatively charged parts of that molecule are interacting with positively and negatively charged parts of another molecule or positively and negatively charged ions or charged particles. It works both ways. We say like dissolves like, um, charged or polar things will dissolve in charged or polar things. Um, nonpolar things can dissolve with nonpolar things. So we'll, we'll revisit that concept um, quite a bit later. And of course, it's going to be forming hydrogen bonds with um, those other substances. We talked about how it will do that, um, and that can make uh, that substance dissolve in the water. And I just want to show you one more picture kind of showing what that looks like. Here's where it's uh, water is dissolving, not a polar molecule, but um, an ionic solid. So this ionic compound, sodium chloride, we've talked about that re uh, recently in our chemistry review. We have positively charged sodiums, negatively charged chlorines, and here you're going to see the negatively charged oxygens want to interact and will attract out the positively charged sodiums and vice versa. The hydrogens are going to interact with the chlorine. And once they're kind of out, they're going to be surrounded by the water molecules. Well, what this looks like when you zoom way out is salt totally dissolved in the water. Instead of being this big clump like you see in that little, um, that little cube of crystal, it's going to be dissolved and distributed evenly throughout the water. And that is it. All right, guys. Well done. We will see you soon.